Hi everyone, um, I'm Tessa Hibbert from the Blaygrave Trust and um, Blaygrave is a small independent funder. Um, we fund uh, exclusively to youth uh, organisations and we have a geographical focus, so we're focused on the southeast of uh, the UK. Um, but the southeast has quite a sort of blurred boundary in our minds, so we do have partners in Wiltshire and some in Bristol as well. So covering the south, I would say. <clears throat> So the first question um, that I want to talk about is why we were motivated to change and adapt our approach to funding and partnerships. Um, and I wanted to start with some quotes. The first is, um, so when I sit down to another application, making sure we fit all the guidelines, I can't help thinking of that Einstein quote. I expect you all know it. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And then another with refreshing honesty. Some funders seem to enjoy being elusive and not engaging with organisations at all. On some occasions, it's also felt like the funder has almost played games with us. Does anyone empathise or recognise any of those quotes? Perhaps somebody in this room said that, I don't know. Um, these quotes are actually taken from a survey that the Blake Grove Trust was involved in, along with the Esme Fairburn Foundation, another grant funding organisation, of voluntary sector organisations in 2016. <clears throat> And one of the very clear messages that came from that survey and many other surveys and research uh, was that funders are, are putting unnecessary restrictions on the organisations that they partner with, which are actually detrimental, do not recognise the complexity of the systems in which voluntary sector organisations are working and the social sector as a whole and the complexity of people's lives. Um, this was reinforced for us through conversations with our partners. We have around 50 partnerships with youth organisations and try to work in a very relational way. And through those conversations, we became very aware of uh, the complexity of the systems in which they are operating. I think many funders attempt to put in tightly defined project parameters <clears throat> in order to try and help them measure and identify impact in the hope that that will create more impact for beneficiaries, for service users, for young people. But what we increasingly came to realise that these hoops for organisations we were putting up through funding just weren't working to create impact. Instead, they were actually slowing down the organisations that we wanted to help. Um, according to this survey, Listening for Change, you can find the report, by the way, on the Blaygrave Trust's website if you're interested to read many more similar quotes. Um, about a third of the organisations that responded said that in turn, about a third of their time was spent simply managing their funding contracts. And, I mean, this just makes no sense. I love that quote that Dawn put up earlier. How can we make common practice out of common sense? It makes no sense for organisations to be working in that way. Um, and also, it's personally demotivating. I think this really taps into a very key point that's been raised already about personal motivation. Um, it's a demotivating thing to read as a funder, read some of this uh, response from um, the partners that you know, we and many others are funding. So the next question I wanted to address was, well, what have we done? What's our approach now since 2016, since all this learning? What have we been doing? Well, our approach is we start from a place that recognises local knowledge, context and creativity can't be neatly conveyed on paper. 
And we recognise that organisations uh, working in the social sector need to be agile, <clears throat> very much linking with the key themes that have come up today. Um, a system that's based around short-term funding and one that's based around very specific project reporting, as has been mentioned, projecting three years hence exactly how many clients and exactly what outcomes will come from that, just doesn't, uh, doesn't come feature in that. We've also start from a place which recognises we need to build relationships with our partners so that they in turn are able to build relationships with the young people that they're supporting. And a relationship based on trust is essential to acknowledge this. So what we've done in response is that we now provide um, core funding wherever possible. And our funding can be used, and when I say core funding, just to define that, I mean funding that organisations can use for a purpose that they feel is, uh, is the most pressing. And that may be to keep the lights on to pay a course key salary. Uh, it may be for a piece of research, evaluation or project work. Um, another key factor of our approach is that um, we try to maintain accountability and we try to keep that dialogue open with our partners. So our relationship with partners is, as I say, based on trust, based on frequent conversations and interactions, evolving partnerships. Um, and the element of accountability, the way in which we try and hold ourselves to account is very important to us. And what we've brought into that is um, very frequent as we're able to um, points of monitoring and feedback from our partnerships. So we ask regularly through the course of a relationship with a grant funding organisation, uh, what do they think of our practice? We publish on our website a set of commitments to the organisations that we fund, and we ask them how we're living up to that. And that's because we're committed to evolving ourselves. We're committed to learning. We don't have an application form. Instead, when we're making partnerships with organisations, our assessments are based on meetings, meetings with key staff, <coughs> reviewing um, documents, really getting under the skin of an organisation, and trying to understand the extent to which they themselves as an organisation are responsive to the young people that they are working with. How accountable are they to the young people they seek to serve? And I think accountability must play a really key part in all of this. How do they know what young people think of them? And what have they done as a re in response to what they hear? And we also try to look at, um, you know, very interestingly, the if the organisation knows the system that they're working with, are they seeking to change that? Or are they... Um, <coughs> you know, putting a plaster on emerging symptoms, as it were. How do they know they're making a difference? And how are they course correcting? How are they adapting and learning? And how can we learn from them? It all starts getting, you know, feedback on your feedback mechanisms. It starts getting a bit sort of reductive. Um, I think the key point that I would just like to say for us is that we are now moving forward, looking at monitoring our grant partnerships in order to learn, rather in order to measure. And I think that's really important for us. I can't say we've cracked this, um, but it's very important to our ethos and approach. So the next thing <clears throat> I wanted to talk about um, Um, just to say, this is a diagram which sums up the way in which Blaygrove Trust is now emerged, uh, our emerging approach, which is a threefold, um, a three-pronged strategy. We partner with youth organisations. We also um, place um, equal emphasis on influencing longer-term change and supporting learning. And thirdly, promoting young people's voice directly 
and trying to seek opportunities to improve the way society listens to young people. So moving on from that, one specific initiative I wanted to highlight was uh, one called the Listening Fund. We launched the Listening Fund um, earlier this year with three other funders, Comic Relief, Big Lottery and the Esme Fairburn Foundation. And this is um, a specific initiative committing um, to try to support youth organisations to better listen and respond to the young people they seek to serve. The reason all we and the other funders we're partnering with wanted to launch this is because we believe if we want organisations to learn, we've got to be committed to learn. So we're trying to push the boundaries as well. We want, we want young people to be able to challenge thinking, <coughs> systems and prejudice themselves directly. So we're supporting youth-focused organisations to better listen to young people and respond to what they hear. One of the features, just to um, point out, the Listening Fund, which has now launched, we've got partnerships with 22 youth organisations um, in place and running for two years. One of the features of that fund is that we've launched a, um, an assessment tool which is an opportunity for those organisations to review their own practice in this sphere. And there are some quite interesting findings coming out from that, that youth organisations, unsurprisingly, as all of us, are committed to listening to young people, but they're not necessarily um, being held to account for what they hear. In other words, we can all listen, doesn't mean we're going to do anything with what we say. So, I wanted to move on now just to um, talk about the learning, what we've found in terms of the benefits and also the challenges. I've made it sound like we've got this all sewn up. Believe me, we have not. Um, and I should have said at the, at the um, top that I have uh, Claire Cannock here, who's one of the trustees of the Blade Road Trust, so she can also talk about this approach. We've seen some huge, huge benefits in terms of working broadly uh, using the approach that I've outlined. Our partners, the incre increasing confidence that we have in our partners through the depth of knowledge, the fact that actually stepping away from detailed monitoring reporting forms has actually brought more capacity to our team. And that capacity has allowed us to focus on learning about ourselves, our own practice, and what we hear. The, the detailed knowledge and um, relationships we have with our partners has enabled a much better community. So there's that convening and collaboration power is strengthened, which uh, I think doesn't happen when you're in a bilateral conversation about number of outcomes. Um, and we are seeking increasing opportunities to bring our partners together for days of sharing and networking, community of practice, um, specific initiatives like the Listening Fund and so forth. Um, the, the trusting nature of our partnerships means that our partners are uh, telling us more about things that go wrong. So there's that admission of, you know, this one didn't work, but we've tried this, and we try to in, engage positively in those conversations and are really open to hearing about them, because Ability to course correct, we see, is absolutely essential. <clears throat> Challenges, however. Culture change has been really challenging. Culture change, um, it's quite... We've moved very fast in a very... We've moved very far, very fast. We're a small and nimble organisation. In fact, the Blade Grove Trust is made up of three members of staff. Um, and the trustee board. So we're a, we've got that luxury, recognise that many others are not working in that complex um, situation. And actually, us bringing this new way of working has been quite challenging for our partners. I was really interested to hear uh, what Hannah was saying about, I think you said 70% of people you trained in this new way of systems thinking loved it, but 30% found it really difficult. Well, I'd say, you know, actually, with some of our partners, they're 
experiencing culture change, culture shock to some degree with this. And we tried to support and also lead, um, and that's been interesting. I think one of the other things I'd just like to highlight about uh, challenges is actually practicalities for us as a funder. If we're saying to um, the partners that we fund, you know, we don't want a detailed monitoring report, it can be very challenging for me then to actually synthesize and pull out key learning because of the mass of information that I'm getting. And to look across partnerships, which is something as a funder, we have a unique position of being able to do, and pull out some key messages from the sector can be a very challenging thing also. Um, I think what I'd like to just leave with is some uh, opportunities and challenges for the future and the way we, we'd look to look for, go forward with this. A specific piece of work, um, in Southampton, we are trying to do some work in Southampton with um, a piece of research firstly, looking at the complex reality for young people of uh, making that transition from a disadvantaged start into a positive life experience. What are the complex realities for young people? And trying to see what are the policy levers that might be identified locally that we could use that experience towards. So that's something to watch and we're involving the local authority and other partners in those conversations and there's a great appetite to do that. And secondly, we're trying to have conversations in the funder community about changing things, changing the system that we still work within. I mean, for example, imagine we put organisations in the driving seat of reporting to funders. Imagine that they were uh, coming up with one monitoring form and sending it to all their funders. Here you go, here's an update. Or bringing us all together for a meeting or to meet <coughs> the young people they were working with. Hopefully there are exciting times ahead. And I'd just like to finish with a positive quote. We've started to get some very positive feedback from our feedback surveys about being confident and being able to provide personalised services that respond to the complexity of young people's lives.